Hello, everybody, and welcome to another lecture of 6837. Today, we're going to pretty much conclude our discussion of computer graphics by considering the very last piece of the computer graphics puzzle, which is the output device. Specifically today, we're going to focus a little bit on the mechanics of digital display technology in order to show at least a very rough outline of how the work that you've put into producing bits describing an image actually produces something in the visual world, right? So now we've completed our entire graphics pipeline from a scene description to a rendering and animation to the graphics card and all the way out to the display device. Now, as a quick disclaimer at the beginning of today's lecture, I should warn all of you guys that I am not an expert on hardware. If you go to my webpage, you'll see that the research that my students and I carry out is very much uh, sort of theoretical rather than applied, especially judged by the hardware axis. Uh, so we're going to have some informal descriptions of what's going on in output devices. But we're not going to dive into many of the technical specs, largely because your instructor doesn't know a whole lot about them. That said, you are currently in a unique department uh, relative to other computer science departments throughout the uh, United States and the world in that we are a department of electrical engineering and computer science. So even without leaving course six here at MIT, you can probably find really interesting courses that go through this kind of material for an entire semester instead of one kind of superficial lecture at the end of a graphics course. Mm. Okay, so let's get started. Today, our outline is pretty straightforward. We'll talk about two-dimensional display technology. That's probably what you're looking at right now as you listen to today's lecture. We'll talk a little bit about 3D displays and some of the emerging technology that exists in that world. And we'll conclude with a bit of discussion of virtual reality and augmented reality displays, which are becoming increasingly popular, especially as the loop between vision and graphics becomes ever tighter and as hardware becomes efficient enough to make for a responsive virtual reality uh, display system. So let's get started. We'll start by talking about 2D displays, which I think is pretty much where most of our course 6837 has been targeted. So a good keyword to know from the graphics universe, which is used quite a bit, especially when you start reading about gaming engines and so on, is the term stack. Of course, this isn't just a graphics term. This exists just about anywhere in computer science, right? The stack is the big pile of software and eventually hardware tools that all get linked together to make for one giant computer system. Now, for the most part, our course has focused on the upper part of this stack, right? I would say 6.837 is like kind of here. Right? And we've talked about developing uh, algorithms and software that mostly interface with OpenGL uh, to produce an upper level application um, or layer on the stack like a game. Of course, these days, actually, there's sometimes a layer uh, in between here. So tools like Unity uh, are, are designed to wrap around your low level graphics libraries like OpenGL and Gra uh, DirectX. But of course, sitting underneath all of these software tools, are many interesting and to your theoretical instructor terrifying <laughs> pieces of the uh, graphic software stack that are incredibly important. And this includes the operating system kernel, the device driver, uh, right, which is how your computer mediates its communication um, with the graphics card and with the display. And then finally, there is this hardware layer all the way at the bottom, which includes the GPU, which we've talked about as an abstraction quite a bit in this course and the chipset, right, your CPU and, and other things inside of your computer. And of course, the miraculous thing that happens in <coughs> graphics and many other disciplines is that we can operate in this upper level and pretty much disregard what's going on underneath because such fabulous engineering has happened underneath uh, in, in these different parts of the graphics stack that really improve what's going on and allow us to think at a high level rather than thinking about writing system code every single time we want to write uh, something in graphics. It's actually a relatively new development. I mean, it used to be when you wrote graphics code, you really had to have pretty good knowledge of what was going on in your hardware. 
So today's lecture is going to be something like down here. <laughs> um, you know, uh, once you're you're done processing all the bits and bytes in your graphics code, uh, the very last thing you have to do is actually send them back out into the real world in the form of photons and things that our eye can see. Uh, and so, of course, there are many different options for two-dimensional displays, for example. Uh, that I think we see all around us, right? It used to be that CRT was the sort of dominant technology. It's cathode, cathode ray tube. We'll discuss that a little bit. Um, LCD, I think, is probably what you're looking at now, right? Like your laptop screen. There's LED displays, like the giant things at football fields. Plasma, OLED, DLP, electronic paper, and so on. There's so many different display technologies out there. And one of the really cool things is that in basically a single, for example, HDMI output on your computer, you're able to interface with any of them. So we're going to give a bit of a superficial description of what goes on in some of these technologies, just so you have some idea of how your display is actually producing photons at the end of the day. Now, the first one that we're going to start with is CRT, or cathode ray tube displays. Uh, these are like those giant TVs with the big back that you used to see in the 80s and 90s. I grew up with these, but now they're less popular. Um, but they're also sort of the simplest ones to understand, and they explain some of the history of graphics technology. So the basic uh, idea in a CRT display is described on the slide here. So what's going on is that in the back of this big empty space in the interior of your TV or your computer monitor, if it's an old CRT, is an electron gun uh, that can produce an ele uh, electron uh, uh, beam. And then those beams get focused and deflected onto a screen, uh, which is, of course, the thing that's producing the display. So what goes on in the display is that you send these uh, electrons out to the CRT in just a fixed pattern. This is called the raster, which explains rasterization. By the way, the phrase scan line makes a lot of sense too, right? Because it's just kind of going like this up and down the screen. Uh, and if you send something from the electron beam to the display, when you're at that point in the raster, it lights up for a little fraction of a second. And that is using a physical phenomenon known as phosphorescence, which is basically the process by which energy is absorbed by a substance and then released slowly as light. Now, this entire sentence is important to parse correctly. So remember, there's an electron beam in the back of your display. It sends an electron up that runs into the display. And now the display lights up at that pixel for just a tiny bit of a second. Now, of course, when we talk about relatively slowly, this is relative to the speed of light, which is extremely fast. <laughs> but the reason why that slow release of light energy is so critical is because the electron beam has to go through its entire raster pattern all the way up and down the screen before it returns to that pixel again to potentially light it up one more time. And so essentially the light persists at that location as the electron beam is doing its business elsewhere until it gets an opportunity to return and turn that pixel back on or off. Now, of course, because we're using an electron beam, you can do some kind of fun things with old TVs. Do not do this to your laptop. It will not work and your laptop will die. Um, and don't do it close to a hard drive. But there's some fun experiments that kind of illustrate what's going on in a CRT display. In fact, here's one that was actually filmed at MIT. Hopefully this will load. So here, there's a TV uh, image. It's an old CRT. I don't know why they felt like that to say that. And there's also a uh, film of a clock which is being put right into the TV. Now we have a strong magnet. We bring it close to the screen. What do you think is going to happen? <laughs> the shape of the clock actually distorts in response to the pose of the magnet. Again, I cannot emphasize enough, do not try this experiment at home unless you are confident that you have a CRT display and that there's nothing else nearby that could be affected by this giant magnet. So let's think for a moment about why this experiment is successful. Well, essentially what's going on is that the uh, position of the magnet is affecting the path 
of those electrons as they leave the electron beam and run into the display. So basically what you're doing is rather than having the electrons follow the intended path, they get misdirected by the magnet and run into the wrong pixel, which then lights up. And that explains the distortion in the image that you see. So anyway, this was the old display technology and it was some of the most popular displays until maybe 10, 15 years ago. But these days, uh, I think what we see a lot more is a liquid crystal display or LCD. So the idea of an LCD is described on the slide here. Essentially, it's composed of two polarizing filters, which are perpendicular to one another. Now, when you have polarized light, right, that's effectively just kind of restricting the uh, wave of the light to move in a particular plane. If it then runs through a polarizing filter that goes in the opposite direction, well, nothing comes out. <laughs> um, what happens in between these two fixed polarized filters, I guess one should be rotated 90 degrees to the other, is that there's a particular material, unsurprisingly, called a liquid crystal, um, or a twisted pneumatic, um, where essentially what goes on is the material can be in one of two states. One is that it kind of twists from one side to the other, in which case it can maybe redirect the, uh, the polarization. And the other uh, pose is where it's flat, like this, in which case the polarized light stays polarized, it doesn't rotate, and it runs into the filter on the other side, which is 90 degrees off, so no light comes out of the display. So essentially what's going on is that the twisted pneumatic cell can either change the polarization of the light so that it fits through the other polarizing filter that corresponds to the pixel being turned on, or it can stay the same, in which case the pixel is turned off. So rather than having me, a non-expert, try to explain some of the topics, in today's lecture, we're going to borrow from a few other YouTube videos. I've credited them with the, the link at the bottom of the uh, slide here, um, but we'll just let our, our, our friend uh, explain in more detail. Maybe. Hmm. If you were to zoom in on the monitor you are using to watch this video, you would see thousands of small red, green, and blue dots. Three of these grouped together make up one picture element, or pixel for short. When you split up each pixel, you will see a backlight, three color filters, and polarizers. As light leaves the backlight, it travels along different planes, including the horizontal and vertical planes. The first polarizer only allows light traveling along the horizontal plane to pass through it and onto the color filters. With another polarizer that only allows light to pass along the vertical axis, all the horizontal light waves are blocked, so no light reaches the color filters. This is where the liquid crystals come into play. If you were to look closely at one of these liquid crystals, you would see a transparent electrode on the front and the back, as well as etched glass on the front and the back. Liquid crystals typically orient themselves in random directions until the horizontally etched glass in the rear and the vertically etched glass in the front force them to twist into a predictable pattern. As light passes through the compressed liquid crystal, it naturally follows the path of the molecules so that any light traveling along the horizontal plane exits along the vertical plane. By reintroducing the electrodes and passing electricity through them, we can get the molecules to align themselves in the direction of the electric flow, causing light to no longer twist when passing through the liquid crystal. When we place these crystals back into the pixel, we can see that the light from the backlight will pass through the horizontal filter get twisted into a vertical position by the liquid crystals, and then flow through the vertical polarizer to the color filters. However, if we turn on the electrodes, then the light is no longer twisted by the liquid crystals and stops at the vertical polarizer. By adjusting the amount of electricity that flows through each set of electrodes, we can control how much light reaches each color filter, and therefore what color is seen on the display. We generally talk about color... Okay. So there's a sort of nicer explanation. <laughs> All right, so uh, a, a few more little details about LCD displays. Uh, they generally fall into two categories when it comes to the actual source of light. Uh, and that has to do with whether the light is coming from outside of the display or inside of the display, right? So a reflective uh, LCD would be something like, uh, you know, the, the clock that you often see, the digital clocks where essentially the light source is just the outside world and then there comes into a mirror and gets bounced back off. 
Um, whereas in a transmissive LCD, like in your laptop screen, essentially there's a fluorescent uh, lamp that's sitting uh, underneath this screen, which is producing the, uh, the light. This is called a backlight. Of course, to get color inside of the pixel in your, your, your LCD display, uh, that's just an additional filter that sits on top. So really, you know, with a lot of these display technologies, it's just modulating the brightness of the light, you know, going from dark to light. And then the color is just a big pattern of RGB sitting on top of the screen. Um, so here is like a 300x view of a typical LCD display. And of course, when you view it from enough of a distance, uh, all of those colors blend together and what you see is the uh, composited result. Uh, in fact, you might recall from a few lectures ago, this allows you to do some interesting things like sub-pixel rendering, which actually anti-aliases the red, green, and blue channels separately uh, so that uh, you can get even better anti-aliasing effect than you could on the true pixel grid. This is basically acknowledging the fact that the red, green, and blue channels are slightly displaced from one another. Okay, so that's an LCD display. Another really important type of display is an LED display. Um, from my perspective, this is a sort of brain dead way you might make a monitor. Um, in fact, it's, it works especially at, at large scale, but you need space between your LEDs. So if you go, uh, you know, watch a football game uh, when the uh, pandemic is over, then essentially sometimes you see these gigantic screens that are like hanging over the, uh, the field. Um, these are often LED displays, which are really just giant arrays of light bulbs, LED bulbs. Uh, that can be packaged together uh, and are controlled like a uh, display. I think this is the simplest one to understand. But there are also many other types of displays. So another cool one is a plasma display panel, PDP. I think this use, gets used a lot in uh, large uh, big screen TVs. Um, so in a plasma display, now you have a big array of little cells that are all filled with some gas like neon or xenon. And what happens is when you apply voltage across the cell, uh, suddenly the uh, gas gets excited and lights up. So just like our LCD uh, discussion, let's uh, see some discussion of plasma. The answer is the plasma. Each subpixel is filled with a mixture of gas, xenon and neon. When an electrical impulse of about 300 volts rushes through a subpixel on its way to the electrodes, Electrons from the gas mixture are violently torn off and suddenly float freely. That drastically changes the state of the mixture. It's no longer gas. It's now plasma. It's a highly energized state of matter. But it's a state that lasts only as long as the electrical discharge. As soon as the discharge ends, the freed electrons immediately return to their places and the plasma once again becomes gas. What's important is that as they return to their places, the electrons release their surplus energy in the form of ultraviolet rays. It's these rays that excite the subpixel, which gives off light that combines with the light given off by the two other subpixels, and together they light up the pixel. Every second, the plasma screen sends more than 2 billion electrical impulses into the subpixels in order to turn the gas there into plasma. The sole purpose being the ultraviolet emissions given off once the plasma returns to its gas state. All that so pictures can appear pixel by pixel on the screen. Okay, so there's a uh, <laughs> more enthusiastic uh, explanation of plasma than your instructor could probably uh, 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 muster here. Sort of a similar display from an abstract level, though I'm sure from an engineering level is quite different, is an organic LED, um, which uses, instead of uh, gases, uses some kind of organic material to produce light under uh, voltage here. So again, there's, there's no backlight. Um, which can make for a really nice uh, black color, you know, potentially thin size and high contrast. Um, so there are a lot of nice uh, properties, although uh, the cost can be uh, higher and sometimes the lifespan is lower. I think uh, for cell phones, sometimes this is being applied, um, but I could be wrong. Now, finally, I thought I would mention one of my favorite display technologies, you know, somehow in my mind, it like works like a Rube Goldberg machine, you know, like one of these crazy 
ballets of different mechanical parts moving around that shouldn't coordinate but somehow do. And that's the DLP projector. Normally at this point in time in class, I would point out the DLP projector in the back of our uh, classroom. But of course, today you're probably watching our lecture on an LCD screen. But these are the uh, projectors that you see in classrooms and movie theaters and so on. And I don't know, when I read the descriptions of these things, they just, they sound like miracles to me. I, I wish I could be inside of a DLP just watching all the parts move around. Um, so the basic uh, idea here is that um, in a DLP projector, you have a few different moving parts. You have a light which is being produced with maybe a wheel that's spinning around and, and pulsing at a particular rate. So the wheel spinning around could have different color filters so that it's like kind of cycling between red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue. Blah. Um, and then that light does not get sent directly out of the projector. Um, but instead, if we take a look at this diagram on the lower right, what happens is the light comes out of the light source and runs into a chip, which is on the bottom of the uh, projector. And then it gets reflected back out. Or it doesn't. So it ends up in one of two places. It either gets reflected out into the real world, or it gets reflected to just a light absorber, which is also within, oops, within the projector. And so here's what this little mirror looks like. And the incredible thing, I mean, there's one of these per pixel in your display. And the idea is that the light comes in from the fixed light source. And depending on how this mirror is pointed, either the light bounces off and gets sent into the real world, or the mirror rotates and then the light just gets wasted. It gets run into the light absorber. Now, in principle, this is straightforward, right? I could, I could stand in front of a light with a mirror and just redirect it toward the wall or your face and you would receive light or you wouldn't. The really incredible thing about the DLP is that this is happening at like 30 frames a second, right? So there are these little itty bitty uh, uh, mirrors that are, are moving around in the interior of your DLP projector at a rate that's so fast, it produces an image that feels still on the display. So anyway, I, I just find this totally incredible. Uh, but the, the, that's uh, the reason why you're able to get such a bright uh, image with your projector is that essentially the light source is decoupled from the display, right? The light source is just a really, really bright light bulb that's being shined onto these mirrors. Uh, and, and because of that, uh, you can afford to have a much brighter light than what would have to go through your screen and like an LCD, which would be a you know, backlight. Of course, there are other displays you might not think about. So another one would be your Kindle or your e-ink uh, kind of reflective display. Um, these are displays that tend not to have backlights and behave almost similarly to the uh, what the, the um, reflective LCDs that we talked about before. Um, e-ink displays are passively updated. So the basic idea here is that they're these little capsules which are filled with some solution um, that's suspended in, in a die. And so you can apply voltage to basically swap up and down which uh, die is on top, right? So you can either move the white particles to the top or the bottom of each of the micro capsules, and that controls whether or not the display is black or white. So you apply that voltage, the display changes, and then it just stays that way. You don't need to use additional electricity. And so for displays where the update rate is low, but the image is going to have to stay there a long time. So for example, your ebook, right? You display a page and then it takes some time to read. This can be a really nice technology. You can get some version of color by like putting a filter on top of these screens, but they tend to be quite weak. Um, you really need a, a backlight to, to make that work, especially because now you have one third of the pixels to work with for each color. So anyway, that's an extremely quick uh, summary of some 2D displays. Let's talk about some 3D ones uh, next. So of course, 3D displays are really tricky, you know, and display technology has been around for a long time. Um, many of these things rely on all kinds of different properties of the human visual system, including, you know, phenomena like stereopsis, uh, where essentially by using two eyes, uh, we can uh, get a better version of the world than, than with just one, um, which is essentially, you know, due to 19th century uh, 
scientists who were the first to explain uh, binocular vision. So, for example, uh, Charles Wheatstone and, and, and friends. Now, on a flat display, achieving stereo 3D images is, is really tricky. Uh, and there are many different technologies that can allow you to do that that have different trade-offs in, ter in terms of what 3D effects you're actually able to perceive and which ones we kind of leave out and hope that your brain might fill in. These can fall into different categories. So, for example, there are active displays. Um, so an example might be glasses that shutter between the left and the right eye. Right, so that means that the glasses and the display on the screen have to kind of coordinate with each other. Or maybe there's some passive ones like polarized glasses. So maybe my left eye has polarization vertically, my right eye has polarization horizontally. Um, or anaglyph rendering where like you put a little lens on the top of your computer screen to direct rays out but not forward toward the two eyes so that you can view a 3D effect so long as you're looking at the screen from a particular location. So all of these displays are trying to negotiate different cues that our brain uses to sense the 3D world. Uh, and there are many of these. So for example, to sense depth, sometimes we use uh, binocular uh, disparity, basically the idea that images look different because of the locations of your two eyes. Um, we also use a number of ocular depth cues, like the rotation of your eyes and, and the accommodation. So vergence is the idea you have to rotate your eyes closer to see something uh, closer to the camera. Uh, accommodation has to do with the focus. And we also uh, see depth cues that are just visible even in one eye, right? Like pictorial depth cues, including occlusion, like what object is on top. Uh, size, right? The left circle kind of feels closer to the camera than the right one shadows and so on. And so the big challenge of engineering a display that tries to fool your brain into thinking that you see 3D is that you would like all of these different cues to be consistent with one another. Of course, doing that is basically the same as setting up a 3D scene. So typically these displays have to give something up. So for example, sometimes disparity and occlusion conflict. Like maybe you have, remember, um, we talked about disparity as having different images projected into your two eyes, and there are a number of technologies that accomplish that. But if they're sitting on top of a computer screen, then what's going to happen right along the edge of the screen is that suddenly the 3D objects get cut off and you just see whatever's behind the screen, um, which can really screw up you know, disparity versus occlusion uh, style conflicts with one another. Right? In this case, the computer screen appears to be behind the lily pad that it's rendering, but then, of course, at the edge of the screen, suddenly the screen's on top because we can't display the lily pad outside of the, the little rectangle of your screen. And so that could break the illusion of depth and create a bit of a contradiction that your brain has to resolve. Of course, there are many different challenges here. So for example, um, asking your viewers to uh, focus on things that are too close to the screen um, can be really painful, especially if you're asking them to basically cross their eyes in a virgin's sense. Um, so there can be some mismatch between the accommodation and stereopsis that can really make a challenge as you move away from your display. So, and of course, this depends on the viewer. So for example, I personally am pretty sensitive to this stuff. And, and um, sometimes, you know, there, there's this sort of conflict between focusing on a screen that's behind you, but having the vergence of an object that's right in front of your eye. Um, so sometimes it turns out that there's some really clever technologies out there um, that may actually go back and do some correction and improve the image so that there's some feeling of depth, even if it's a little bit inaccurate, but reduces the eye strain. This is really critical, especially for 3D movies. So when you go into the 3D movie theater, <laughs> when they're open again, um, essentially what can happen is, um, you know, for example, maybe you put a camera right underneath an object that's dropping towards your face. Um, that can cause some really extreme discomfort with the divergence of your eyes. You know, you're basically crossing your eyes at some point. But maybe you can get that effect, but still modulate the uh, velocity of the object as it moves toward uh, your face uh, to avoid that level of discomfort. 
There are other types of displays out there that try to get 3D effects, not just by wearing glasses, but by having other uh, styles of redirecting light. So another clever one is an auto stereoscopic display. This is basically the idea that you can get binocular parallax without wearing 3D glasses by redirecting light in a very careful fashion. So here um, I show you two different examples of that. One is a lenticular display. That's what we show you on the left-hand side. And one is a parallax display. The basic idea here is that you have some LCD screen that's sitting underneath but now, rather than just looking directly at that screen, we're going to put a new layer on top of that screen, which is basically just some fixed either lens like what we see here, or even just blockage like what we see on the right-hand side. And the basic idea is that we want to redirect slightly different signals to the two eyes. And so what these uh, lenticular um, objects allow you to do, these lenses, is essentially uh, ref uh, diffract, ref refract the light in directions other than straight out of your screen, which is uh, what you would want for this kind of display. Uh, or similarly for a parallax barrier, basically you're just doing the same thing, but now uh, using a physical object blocking light moving in a direction that you don't want. And so in an auto stereoscopic display, the advantage is that you don't have to wear 3D glasses, but the disadvantage is that you have to have your eyes in the right place. Right? So notice that these images are designed for two particular eye positions um, that are demonstrated. If we were to move the viewer backward, suddenly the image wouldn't really make sense anymore. And so these are displays that are optimized for viewing at a very particular distance, which obviously wouldn't work, for example, in a 3D movie theater with viewers sitting at all kinds of locations. But for things like the Nintendo 3DS or this uh, LG Optimus 3D, if I recall that phone wasn't terribly popular, um, basically these little mini 3D displays where you're always holding it roughly at arm's length, these sort of techniques can, can make a lot of sense. And you can even switch off between 2D and 3D mode by just turning on and off the, uh, the different, um, enabling or disabling the, the parallax barrier that is in front of the LCD. Uh, now, these particular displays are optimized for just two eye positions, so one particular location of a viewer. You can take that to the limit and try to redirect things every which way by using lenticular things that um, essentially send light in very controllable set of directions. Um, this can make for unobtrusive displays with wider kind of range of views. The only problem is that essentially the resolution of these displays decreases substantially. Why is that? Well, maybe I have, you know, 10 pixels in a row, but each pixel is now only controlling the light rays that are moving in one individual direction that are only going to get viewed from one particular angle. So in particular, you've basically divided the resolution of your display by 10. And so you really have to pack a lot of pixels in there to get a reasonable multi-view auto stereoscopic display. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> um, that said, there are many different technologies that, that have attempted this over the years, and, and some of these screens are pretty compelling. Now, a different way that you could pull off the same effect, which I think is kind of fun, is uh, shown here. So here's a 360 degree multi-view auto stereoscopic display. I think this is so cool. Essentially what's going on in this video clip is that you have a spinning mirror, right? So the mirror is determining what direction the light is coming out. And somebody's done a really careful calculation uh, so that the mirror is synced up with the projector and what's coming out in that particular direction is what you should need to have a 360 degree display. Every once in a while, I think you see these things at like conferences and hotel displays. And in fact, you can even make them fast enough for some manipulation. These didn't really catch on. I mean, the main challenge with a display like this is that you have a giant spinning mirror at an extremely rapid rate. So that means that there's a part that could fail. And moreover, you, you, you can't really stick your hands in there, right? So uh, you have to be quite careful to make sure that you don't... Uh, expose this to the outside world and the, you know the resolution is a little bit low but maybe that could change over time okay 
Finally, uh, there are some techniques out there for 3D displays. I think these are somehow the most natural or straightforward um, that directly try to display volumes. So in some sense, the spinning display that I just mentioned for you is uh, can be understood that way. And, uh, you know, these usually mean that you don't have an occlusion, but you just have some rotating part that is just sweeping the entire display volume. So maybe instead of having a mirror in this case, you have a projection screen that's rotating around. And this is what's enabling you to make a light source at any location in the 3D volume. Right, so in the previous slide, we had a spinning mirror. Now we have a spinning screen that isn't trying to redirect the light. The idea is just that when the screen is in a particular position and then you project light onto it, it appears as if the light is coming out of that point. Okay. There are also some static volume displays that don't have to spin around. Um, so a very simple one of those is basically like taking a computer screen, taking five computer screens and stacking them right on top of each other. Uh, and so long as those screens are transparent, then maybe you can't get a 3D effect, but you can kind of get like a 2.5D effect by having a few layers of 3D information, which could be good enough. But really, the most popular 3D-ish display that we see today is in virtual reality and augmented reality displays. Now, in case you're curious, there is a difference between these two terms. A virtual reality or VR display essentially is going to cover up your eyes and replace what is in your visual field with just a totally new image. Right? So I think that's what we uh, kind of envision when we think about virtual reality, augmented reality, right? Just a pair of opaque glasses with two computer screens beaming directly into our eye. Augmented reality, on the other hand, are typically displays that you can see through augment your visual field with other interesting information like maybe you know puts a label on top of, of some information that you're seeing um, augmented reality displays can be useful for sort of enhancing our experience in the real world rather than replacing it which is what virtual reality would do now these days that terminology has gotten a little bit fuzzier in particular there's one new brand of augmented reality which is quite popular and that happens on your cell phone so, of course, many of our cell phones now are equipped with cameras. And so one thing you could do is kind of make your cell phone in some sense disappear, right? And the, the way that you can do that is you take in uh, images from the camera outside of your cell phone, and then you just display the same image on the phone itself. So in other words, the phone is sort of pretending like the phone doesn't exist, right? It's just displaying what would have been on the other side of the phone. Um, so... That creates a new opportunity for an augmented reality display where it's still an opaque display, but you can abstractly kind of feel like you're seeing through it because it's just translating the camera signal into output. But in that process, it also augments the signal with other information. So I think that's typically considered augmented reality, even though it's not the same set of light rays that are going all the way from the outside universe to your eye. Now, of course, there are many popular VR and AR displays. This guy seems to be enjoying his uh, Oculus VR. Uh, there's a HoloLens from Microsoft. Already these slides are out of date. They, uh, they change every year. And the history of virtual reality actually goes back really longer than you might think. So in some sense, the earliest VR displays were in the uh, early 1800s. Um, these are these devices called stereoscopes, where essentially you take maybe two photographs or you draw two images, which are stereoscopically displaced from one another. And then you hold this uh, little wood viewer up to your eyes. Looks kind of like an opera viewer to me. And then when you do that, uh, essentially what you're doing is filtering out those two images and displaying them to your two eyes. And you can experience a whole new static 3D world <laughs> through this extremely rudimentary display. Now, the uh, second thing you see here, which I've always found these images to be totally terrifying, even though I know they're a positive development in the VR, AR world, um, are experiments at MIT by Ivan Sutherland, arguably making one of the very first VR devices, um, which is all the way back in the 1960s. I don't know if people realize that. And then just lately, there have been an explosion of virtual reality and now a augmented reality displays thanks to a combination of a few factors, right? There's much lower latency than there used to be. Um, and, and also the uh, display technology is getting a lot better. Uh, of course, there are other interesting landmarks in the history as well. <laughs> uh, 
one of my favorites is the uh, the first head mounted uh, display uh, like what you see here uh, on the left hand side so if you you can combine that with the uh, stereoscope before now you don't have to hold on to it anymore you can wear a hat and have your own 3d display I've always been extremely curious not curious enough to actually look it up but if anybody has a good explanation for me why your stereoscopic display really needs a pointy tip and like a muzzle <laughs> I would love to know, <laughs> but I digress. Um, of course, uh, there were other uh, virtual reality, augmented reality technologies that have come out over the year. Um, Game Boy actually had one all the way back in the 90s. It was not very successful. I think the latency was really painful. and The, 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 the resolution wasn't so great. Um, but these days, uh, technologies are really exploding every which way. Oculus, Sony, Facebook, all these companies have their own virtual reality I guess Oculus and Facebook are the same now. And so there's actually a proliferation of different technologies with different trade-offs in terms of field of view and so on. So there were a number of steps in the evolution of this technology that enabled what we have today. You know, the, the technology in the 1960s uh, from Ivan Sutherland was one of the first electronic or digital displays that we have uh, evidence of. Um, there was, uh, in the 1980s and 90s, people thought about haptics and, and human computer interaction more, you know, they kind of realized that the human part of the computer loop is actually pretty important. And we should understand how humans interact with computers to make better virtual reality devices. And then lately, especially driven by cell phone technology, in fact, there's a really goofy virtual reality device that just slots a cell phone in front of your eyes, right? The Google cardboard. Um, but we now have low cost, high resolution and low latency displays, which really have enabled the uh, technologies that we see now. And these are coupled, by the way, with tracking and other, and other important tasks. But even some of the basic ideas were around in the 1960s. Um, so here we see a, a head mounted three dimensional display, including two little CRTs, rendering, head tracking, interaction, model generation, and all this happened. In 1968, I think this was the Sword of Damocles, was what uh, Ivan Sutherland called this crazy device. But it's just absolutely amazing how much stuff was anticipated um, in, in making a display that roughly follows the same pieces that we have today, right? I mean, these are the same components that go into the Oculus or anything else. In fact, if you look at the teardown of, for example, this Oculus DK2, it's a couple years out of date, you'll see basically the same pieces that were uh, engineered back in the 60s when this technology was just beginning to appear. Now, there are many different ways to compare different virtual reality displays. Um, and when you go out in the market and you want to purchase one of your own, uh, some things to think about uh, include the field of view, um, I think is really the one of the main ones, as well as the latency, which is like how quickly it can update uh, and so on. The field of view is essentially the width of the image that's displayed in front of you. Like at some point you're going to perceive the edge of the screen and just have black on the side. So for example, this uh, version of the Oculus had 110 degree um, field of view, which I think is, is, is pretty good. Now these virtual reality displays that I'm showing you, their job in life is to occupy your entire field of view if they can, right? It's just a function of how good the uh, display technology is. There are other technologies out there that are attempting to sort of do the opposite and be less intrusive. So one of the ones that was promising, although it got discontinued, but my bet is it'll reappear someday, was the uh, the Google Glass. I think they still sell it to like medical people. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so the Google Glass is definitely on the augmented reality side of the spectrum. And this was intended basically as a little augmentation to your eyeglasses so that you could just beam your email directly into your brain at all parts of the day while still perceiving the outside world. I think, unfortunately, the value proposition of this device relative to just holding your phone in front of your face was maybe not um, awesome. But the technology behind the Google Glass was pretty cool. So the basic idea here is that, you know, you have your, your, your viewer. Um, yeah, so there's their eye. They're looking out into the world. Uh, and you have a uh, LED. And the basic idea here is that there's some beam splitter that's sitting in between. 
And what gets leveraged here is an effect called the Pepper's Ghost effect. The idea that if you have bright enough light, then it'll get reflected. So this is an idea that goes all the way back to the 1860s. So basically this was a technology that first appeared, I think, in like theater tricks so that you could have characters like ghosts. <laughs> My uh, three-year-old niece calls them ghosts. But in any event, um, the basic idea of the Pepper's ghost effect is that maybe you have a mirror in your scene that's pointing, uh, you know, toward uh, something that is extremely dimly lit. And so, or, or maybe uh, not a mirror, I'm sorry, a, uh, a piece of glass. So you have a piece of glass, which is pointing toward a dimly lit part of your scene. Then basically what you're going to see is right through the piece of glass, right? It's just the stuff on the other side. So that's like the situation shown on the left. You have your spotlight on some scene. Your viewer is somewhere back here. And yeah, there's a piece of glass, but you're just seeing right through it. And now you want a ghost to show up. So you turn on a light. And that light uh, adds light to a, the something that in the reflected direction of the piece of glass, which was before just dark. So now suddenly there's a light source. Um, and the light source, because it's bright enough, gets reflected off of the surface of the glass and back toward your eye. And so this was a clever way to make like a ghost suddenly appear in your scene. Although in order to do this, you needed two copies of your scene with very similar structure. Uh, let's see. So here's a fun demo uh, using uh, Pepper's ghost effect in combination with Legos. So maybe we'll uh, scoot forward a little bit. Locate it off to one side where it's out of view. The plexiglass is set at a 45 degree angle to both the audience and the ghost. At this angle, the background remains clearly visible. But the plexiglass also partially reflects an image of the ghost. To the audience, it looks like there's a transparent ghost in the scene in front of them. It's pretty simple. So now I'm going to show you some ways that you can implement this technique. The simplest way to apply it is in photographs and video. I think it's pretty obvious. Start how to by setting up your this technique. A large sheet of plexiglass. Then you need a way to backdrop, but you do need to use a flashlight to help illuminate the ghost. The result is a transparent figure in the window that stares at people as they walk by your house. Creating a ghost in a doorway uses basically the same procedure, but because the opening is much larger, you need a much larger sheet of plexiglass. Well, that's how to make Pepper's ghost. Try it out and have fun. There you go. How you can make uh, Pepper's cat. Now, of course, that's one uh, version of augmented reality uh, in, the, in the Google Glass. A different one, like we already mentioned, uh, was to make a phone that you can basically just see through. Now, the really amazing thing is that our cell phones, so here I've got an iPhone. Over time, they've been equipped with more and more cameras in the back of your phone. And these are cameras that are not just sensing visible light, but also things like depth. And so what that allows our AR technology to do, our augmented uh, reality uh, technology, is to have a really good understanding of the 3D structure of the scene that also is coming in in the, uh, the light sensor. And that way you can augment it in interesting ways. So for example, uh, I think the, uh, some furniture companies now, when you go to their website, you can like hold up your phone to an area inside of your house and it'll put a piece of furniture in the room in so, such a way that you can actually kind of walk around it and it tracks with the ground. The reason it's able to do that is that it's tracking your location in space, maybe even occlusion with objects that would be closer to you than the piece of furniture. Uh, and it's able to do that quickly enough that it can output the result in the display of your phone. So your phone is like a little window into a slightly different reality. It's a pretty cool technology. And I think this is the one that's most likely to change very quickly in the next year or two. So of course, when you're comparing head-mounted displays, other 3D technology, there's so many different considerations that you can look at. Everything from height, weight, fit, the eye box, the eye release, the uh, you know whether or not you have um, a big field of view, a small field of view, whether it's augmented, virtual, um, and 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 where the field of view is located. Um, all of these different technologies uh, have basically evolved to try and uh, cover different use cases for this technology. Everything from basically a uh, pair of smart glasses, right? Like the Google Glass, whose job in life is to uh, 
just augment the world around you and give you a little extra information to augment a reality, which maybe is covering up a more substantial part of the world to virtual reality where you're just replacing everything outside of your eye with something else. Now, of course, this roughly correlates with the field of view, right? The bigger the field of view, the more stuff you're covering up. Uh, similarly, the angle resolution um, really depends on, on what kind of technology you're using, right? If you want to have the Google Glass, you need to be able to read your email, and maybe you need a high-resolution, small image. Whereas in some of these VR technologies, a bit of a lower-resolution, big image is more important. Similarly for pixel counts. So, in any event, this is just a quick summary of some of the... Uh, important ideas in output devices, uh, with like the ones that we've been interfacing with all semester in 6837, but we really haven't considered the details of how they work. Obviously, I'm not going to test you on all the details of these different displays, but I think it's important to have some intuition for what's going on and why the bits and bytes and real numbers that your graphics card is producing actually can be produced out there in the real world. So with that, I think this is actually our last lecture of 6837. It's been a pleasure to teach all of you guys. Uh, hopefully I'll see some of you in my graduate level courses. Uh, and good luck with your final projects.